All right, my friends, the time has come. This has been a tutorial that's been requested of me quite a few times, and I'm finally going to do it justice and give you the best Flexbox tutorial. So we're gonna be learning CSS Flexbox in this tutorial, and we're going to be learning it, of course, in the Andrew style, which is where we're gonna learn the principles first so you actually understand Flexbox and how to make it work in your own projects. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. There's essentially three properties that you need to know in order to learn Flexbox. And I want to first show you these three properties. They are, as you can see here on screen, they are the Flex Grow property, they're the Flex Shrink property, and the Flex Basis property. Understanding these properties is really essentially key to learning Flexbox. Now, here you can see I've got a little simple class that's called dot box, and there's just these three properties written out in longhand notation. However, most of the time when you're using Flexbox, you'll actually write them in shorthand notation, which looks like this. So the first property here is the Flex Grow property, and the default value is zero. We'll talk about that later. The second value is the Flex Shrink property. The default value here is one. And the last property is this Flex Basis property, and the default value is auto. So let's go ahead and learn, what does Flex mean? So when we say Flexbox, what is Flex? And the easiest way to think about this is flexible. So a flex box is flexible, meaning that the width is a little bit fluid. It can flex in or out depending on its needs. So let's look at the regular width. So here we have just a simple div. It's a, let's say it's a wrapper or a parent. The parent would be the brown and the green would be the child div. And each of these have an explicit width declared. So they're each 500 pixels wide. And this is how it would be displayed in the browser. Now let's go ahead and increase the parent width to 1000 and you can see that the child stays, the green box stays 500 pixels and that's what we would expect. However, if I take the parent down to a width of 250 pixels, you can see now we have what's known as an overflow problem. And this is kind of one of the, the jokes of CSS, this happens all the time. But the box, that green child is now overflowing the parent's bounds and it doesn't quite work. Now I know what some of you may be thinking, that what if I just add percents instead or some other relative unit of measure on that parent element? So in this case, now we have with 100%, with 100% on both the parent and the child. So they're each stretching to, to their bounds. And then if I take the parent element and change its width down to 25%, I no longer have an overflow problem because that child has a width of 100%. So it just shrinks down to the width of the parent. Now this is important to understand because in this case, the width of the child is sort of based on the parent's bounds, which works sometimes, but also doesn't work sometimes. And this is one of the key differences here in Flexbox that you'll learn here in a minute. Flex actually depends on the width of itself or its own content. So here's the big takeaway from Flexbox. Width doesn't take into consideration the content of the actual element where Flexbox does take into consideration the content of the element when determining its size. And that's one of the big key important things to understand right out of the get, get go or, uh, of Flexbox and uh, regular widths. So the big difference, let's go ahead and uh, look at this. So width here, this is the traditional way of doing CSS layout where we declare some widths. And notice that the green box in the middle has some content because the content is bigger, it has an explicit width of 500, but we have an overflow issue because the parent has a width of 250. And then here's how Flexbox works. So in Flexbox, we have the exact same values. Both the parent and the child still have an explicit width declared of 500 pixels. However, the box shrinks below 500 pixels because it's flexible. And this is the difference. Flexbox accounts for that content and will shrink down to accommodate the width based on the own item's content. That's the big difference, okay? So now that you understand the difference between Flexbox and non-Flexbox, the question is, well then, how do I learn Flexbox? And if you've ever looked at the Flexbox spec, there is a lot of properties. So here's just a few of these properties flying across the screen here. And the right way to learn Flexbox is not to just start adding properties at random and seeing what happens. We need to understand first just like we started this, the difference between flex basis, flex shrink, and flex grow, and how those affect the width or height, depending on how we're working, of an element. That key understanding 
Once you grasp that, all the properties are a piece of cake. It'll be really easy to use Flexbox. This is the key concept that we're going to learn. So in order to learn these three properties, we're actually going to now jump over to code and learn them dynamically because we'll be resizing and kind of looking and see how, how each of three, these three elements affect the actual box on a, on a container. So let's go ahead and jump into code. We're going to start with flex basis. This is the key principle to understand that sort of drives everything. So you can see right now, I've just got this parent element, which is kind of this represented by the purple border. And then the child element is this little one right here in the middle. We'll call him the oldest child. So what the default value for flex basis is, is auto. So right now it's automatic and I wanna show you how that behaves. You can kind of think of automatic as just having the elements intrinsic width. So you can see as I scale down here, the oldest child's current width is just the width of the content. And if I come down below where that's gonna break into two lines because it's two separate words, it breaks and it's still allowing this element to shrink. So this is what flex basis auto does. It will grow up to the maximum content and then shrink to the minimum content. And then after this point, you can see then we get an overflow break right at this point. So that's auto. Now we can put in here, you can kind of think of flex basis as a width value. So we can also come in here and just set this to an explicit width. I'm just going to set 200 pixels here. Let's go ahead and save this. And you can see now I have 200 pixels. So no matter what, right, I have a 200 pixel child. And then when I come below, you can see how it shrinks. So flex basis is like a width, except it also allows the element to be flexible. So right now, 200 is going to be what it's going to try to do. But if it's not able to, we're going to allow it to shrink down below to some arbitrary value. And you can see it breaks again right there. And then now we have the same thing happening. Okay. So flex basis, you can use pixel values. You can use relative values like percentages, and it will allow accommodations. The other value here is actually called content. So if I set this to content, it's either auto content or a value. If I set it to content, in this case, it behaves almost exactly like auto. You can see that everything behaves the exact same. So you may ask yourself, well, what's the point of using content if it's the same as auto? And the only time content comes into play is if your element, your child element, also has an explicit width value. So now I want to show you the difference here. So I'm going to go ahead and add a width, and let's just say width of 200 pixels. So I've declared a width, and then I have my flex basis set to content. So let's go ahead and refresh here. And you can see that if you have both of these values present and this is set to content, it sort of ignores the width. So content means no, use the content, not the width. So now let's go ahead and resize and you can see it's still behaving the exact same as before. However, now if I switch this to auto, so if auto exists, which is the default and a width, then width will trump. So in this case, you can see the box actually did grow to 200 pixels. And then the flexing still happens because I have flex basis of auto. So that's the difference between auto and content. One will ignore the width, the other one will take into account the width if a width value exists. Okay, so that's flex basis um, and sort of how that works. Now let's go ahead and add in the other two properties so we can see how they work in conjunction with one another. So we're gonna add the flex dash grow and I'm gonna delete the width value here. We're really not gonna be working with that in the future. Typically with Flexbox, you'll be using the flex basis property for your widths. So I'm gonna set flex grow to zero and then we're gonna set flex shrink to one. I'm just gonna use longhand here just so it's easier for you to read as I'm doing this. Typically you would see this in the shorthand and then flex basis will leave at auto. So this is default. So again, this just behaves just like we barely saw before, where we're allowing the element to shrink because flex shrink is one. Anything greater than zero essentially means, okay, let's use this property. But we're not allowing the element to grow because flex grow is zero. So zero is like false. You can think of it like that. So let's go ahead and now change flex grow to one. Uh, not zero one, just one. And you can see now that oldest child or that child div is growing. So we're allowing it to grow and we're also allowing it to shrink. So now it's completely flexible. It will grow and shrink. Perfect. So when you only have a single child, you're really only going to be using numbers of one or zero. But these are actually ratios and those come into play when we have multiple children um, in play. Well, typically they do. 
when we have multiple children in play. And so let's take a look at that next. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna come over here to the HTML and you can see here in the HTML, just to kind of show you how this looks, all I do is I have a simple parent and this parent has four children. So you can see I've got three of them commented out. I have the oldest child right here. Let's go ahead and uncomment out. The second child, which I'm calling the peacemaker child. And now we've got the peacemaker in there and that looks great. So now we can move back over to the CSS and let's go ahead and add some code for the peacemaker. Now I already have some code set up to make this second child turn a different color just so we can visually distinguish those guys. All right, and let's go ahead and take a look at this. So what's interesting here with Flexbox is you can see that right now, if I go all the way down to this size, the oldest child is actually smaller than the peacemaker child. And that's because the peacemaker child is allowed to grow and shrink according to its content. So each of the children can grow and also shrink. So they're both flexible in this case. So the way this works is as follows. Let's take this back. I'm gonna set the grow value back to zero. So they're not allowed to grow. And so they're allowed to shrink. And so because flex basis is set to auto, right? They're gonna shrink down to that sort of minimum content. And because this has more text in it, it's a little bit wider than the other one. So if I scroll down here, you can see both of those break lines and then they're both gonna shrink down. And then now we get an overflow problem because they're both at their absolute minimum without overflowing the content. So the way Flexbox works, and this is the second key takeaway right here, is Flexbox will use up all of the extra space inside of a container. So in this case, it's all this right hand space and it will distribute that evenly between the children, the two children. So let's go ahead and set this to grow back to one. So if I'm setting this to grow to one, I'm saying basically each of these two children get an equal share, a one part share of this space. So if I was to measure this space out, let's just go ahead and do this really quick. So it looks like that's about 400, I don't know if you can see that, 400, we'll call it 400 pixels, let's just make up a number. So in other words, if I set flex grow to one, this child gets an extra 200 and this child gets an extra 200. So they're each allowed to grow by 200 pixels. So let's go ahead and save that. And now if we do a little quick measurement on these guys, so let's measure this one. And you can see that this guy is 400 pixels exactly. Now, if we measure this guy over here, it's smaller, right? It's 344. That's because it was smaller to begin with. This is the key takeaway here. So if I set this back to zero and refresh again, right? This child is bigger because it has more content. So when we add 200 pixels to this, it's going to be more than 200 pixels to this. That's the way Flexbox works. It takes the extra space and distributes it evenly among all those children. All right, so now I've got some CSS where this is specifically targeting this second child. So let's go ahead and uh, change some stuff here. So let's just go ahead and add the flex. I'll do shorthand here just so you can see the difference. So flex is zero, one, auto, right? That's the default. So in this case, I'm gonna leave flex uh, grow to zero. So this is kind of where we're behaving right now. And let's change this flex grow on this one now to two and the flex grow on this one to one. So they have different ratios on the amount of space. And again, if we think about this, what this is saying is the leftover space, if there is any, right? If there is no leftover space, then these values are ignored. But if there is leftover space in the wrapper, distribute it according to these ratios. So in other words, the nth child, this second child, the peacemaker child is gonna get twice the portion of the first child who's only getting one, uh, a one-th of the portion. So right, if we take this space and we divide it, he's gonna get twice as much, the other one's gonna get uh, one. So let's go ahead and save that. And now you can see, sure enough, they're very different widths at this point because that extra space was distributed between them in those ratios. So if I set this to three to one, he's even gonna be bigger and he's gonna be smaller. Or if I invert it, so I set this guy to one and I set this guy to three. Now this guy will get three times the amount of that space that was left over. And that guy's only getting one amount of the space that was left over. And that's how flex grow works. It's the exact same for flex shrink. So I can determine how much of the available space is distributed when those elements get below uh, their intrinsic size. So when they start to shrink, I can use ratios there as well. So you can really fine tune on how much each thing is allowed to grow. 
and how much each thing is allowed to shrink based on that space distribution in the Flexbox model. Okay, that's the second big key takeaway. So let's go ahead and add the other children here, and then we'll just play around with a few of the properties so you'll fully understand how this works. Okay, so here I have all four children turned on. We have the oldest child, peacemaker child, the rebel, and of course the last child is the favorite child. And right now, all of the elements are not allowed to grow. All of the flex, flex grow is set to zero. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna take this little teeny tiny one, the rebel child here, the, and let's make it have a flex grow property one. So just that one, I'm gonna to set to one. So he's gonna have one ratio of the leftover space, but because the other three children don't get any, he'll essentially get all of that space. Go ahead and save, and you can see sure enough, he's allowed to stretch now, all the rest of them are not. And you can see that behaves through a responsive layout. So he'll always take up all of the available space. The other three children will not because he's the only child that's allowed to grow. Well, how can I make each of these columns, so to speak, each of these children take up an equal share of space? Because if there's just a little bit left over here and it's equally distributed between them all, the peacemaker child is going to always be the biggest because it's the biggest intrinsic width to start with. And that is correct. That's the way Flexbox works. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is work with the flex basis property. So in flex basis property, remember this first rule here is applying to all of the elements. And so what we're going to do here is set flex basis to uh, an explicit value. So if I set this to 300 pixels, for example, let's go ahead and save that. Each of the elements, I've got to actually update this on all of them because these uh, rules right here are overriding. So let's go ahead and update. Now in this case, all of the elements are exactly 300 pixels because my flex basis is stating that. And none of them are allowed to grow. So even though the peacemaker child is typically bigger, I'm not allowing it to grow. So in this case, you can see as I restretch and resize here, above 300 pixels, they'll all be exactly 300 pixels. Because I'm allowing each element to shrink by an equal share, when I get below 300 pixels, they'll start to sort of get slightly different sizes based on their content because they're each going to break and wrap at a different um, area. Now, we've been using explicit widths here. You don't have to use 300 pixels. I can set each of these to be a, a, a percentage. For example, I could say I want 25% on all of these because I have a Separate rule, of course, for every single child just to illustrate how this is working. So I can use relative positions as well as pixel positions. And this way it's fully dynamic. It'll completely stretch. I'm allowing the, that to happen that way. Now that you have an idea of really the fundamentals of how Flexbox works, let's go ahead and take a look at all of those other properties that are pretty handy for as far as determining um, the layout and orientation and size and centering of our elements. So let's jump right in. What we do is we specify in the parent element um, up here where we set the, the display, we can specify some properties for alignment on the children. Now the way this works is a little bit confusing, but in Flexbox there's essentially two axes. There's an axis that runs horizontal and that's the main axis. And there's an axis that runs up and down or vertical and that's the cross axis. And that's really all you need to remember. It does get a little bit confusing because in Flexbox, we can actually completely rotate those two axes. So the main becomes vertical and the cross becomes horizontal. And that's just the way it works, but it's pretty easy to work with. So by default, the main axis is the one that runs horizontal. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So we can do uh, an element here called justify, justify content. And I'm gonna set that equal to start. Now. You can see that I can use the keyword start and it will work as of the recording of this. The initial flex spec had to do flex start. So um, most browsers who have incorporated the shorthand, which is the same as CSS grid. But if you're targeting browsers that are slightly older, you'll want to do the full flex start. I'm just going to be using the shorthand start. Okay, so start basically means at the start of the line, which in our case is the left hand uh, side. The reason why we don't say left and right is because of uh, internationalization. So some languages around the world, the start is actually the right-hand side. So that allows for our elements to reflow and be global essentially on the web. So we've sort of switched over our terminology a bit. Okay, let's set this to end. Now you probably guessed it, end is the right-hand side or the end of the parent. So that's over here. So then all of my children automatically slide over to there or I can say center 
and then these guys will center themselves up. And there's one or two other properties like the baseline and things like that. We won't look at some of the more edge cases here. So I can center left or start those or, or end those guys. Okay. Now there's another property here that's called space. Um, just kidding. It's called um, align items. I'm getting ahead of myself. Align dash items. And aligning of the items happens in the opposite. So this is on the cross axis where justify content is on the main axis. So I'm going to set this to start and we're not going to be able to see anything happen here because my parent is flat. So let's go ahead and take the parent and let's give it just like a min height of, I don't know, 300 pixels, just so we can have a little bit of height here. And now you can see, sure enough, the start is the top and end is the bottom. And then the keywords are sort of the same. So align items I can set to end and those are going to jump down to the end or I can set these guys to center and then those guys will jump in the center. It's people always mix these up and you're always kind of guessing which is which. The way I remember it is I think of a paragraph of text. So when you want to justify a paragraph of text, you're sort of working this way. So that helps me remember that, okay, justification is on the main axis and the align items is on the cross axis. Now, where this all gets flip-flopped is we can change those two axes. So we're going to add another property here. We'll just leave the height. It's going to be flex direction. And this is the one that flips the main axis and the cross axis. So the default value here is row, which is what we're at, where everything is going to lay out in a single row. And then I can switch this to column. So if I say column, you can see now it flips everything and now it's going to lay out in a single column. And now the main axis is the one that goes down because I flipped it. The axis stays when it flips and the cross axis is this one. So I can still use these properties of justify content center. So let's turn that one back on. And remember that's going to center it vertically in this case because my main axis flipped. So a centering in that axis is in the middle. And then when I comment out this one here, they're going to now align themselves in the uh, horizontal center because that's now the cross axis. I'm going to set this back to row and notice that the oldest child is first and then the second and third and fourth. Well, I can also do row dash reverse and that essentially inverts the order. So now the oldest child is last and the favorite child is first. And I can do the same thing with column here. Um, if I have this set to column, I can do column reverse and now they're inverted but on the opposite axis. Okay, so that is flex direction. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the wrapping property. Now what happens by default is when I have flex items inside of their parent, you can see that you know they're, they're each set to their intrinsic width because they're not being allowed to grow, which means when the wrapper gets down below where they would break, you can see right here at this point, they go out of bounds. In other words, they are not allowed to wrap down to a new line. They just keep on going on that line forever and ever and ever, even if it overflows their parent element. So what we can do here is we can change that behavior by saying the flex wrap, we can set to either, you can see no wrap, wrap or wrap reverse. So no wrap is default. And notice there's not a hyphen there, which is a bit strange. Almost all CSS properties have hyphens, but this one does not. And we're gonna set this to the non-default value of wrap. And you can see right away what happens, right? Now in this case, it won't overflow the parent. If it runs out of room, it's going to wrap down to a new line. Now, the interesting thing here, and this is where Flexbox starts to get a little bit more complex, is when you have things on multiple lines like this, so the oldest child is first, and then these two, and then this one, the way that the distribution happens, remember we talked about that leftover space, it happens per line. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So if I set oldest child and I allow him to grow, so let's come down to the oldest child here. We'll say flex grow is one. So now he's gonna grow. And let's take this um, rebel child here, which is this guy, and let's set its flex grow to two. Now it's a little bit, you can see it was quick there, but it actually got a little bit bigger than this one. And that's because we're allowing it to have twice the share of the available space. And it happens on each row. And as everything breaks, well, now it's going to have twice the space of the second row, where before it had twice the space of the leftover in the 
second row. There was no third row. I'm confusing myself here. I hope that makes sense. Um, so that uh, you just kind of realize that that space distribution happens in a per row basis whenever you have wrap turned on or flex items that are crossing over in rows. So let's jump back here to the justify content property. That's the one that aligns things on the main axis this way. And we already looked at a few of the properties, but I wanted to show you the rest of these. So if I set this to space around, you can see that Flexbox is going to make the margin, you can sort of think of like the margin on the outside of these exactly equal for every single item. And this is of course is responsive. I'm gonna pull this, whoops, that's the wrong one to pull. Pull this over here so we can kind of see how this works, right? That space is going to be distributed around there. If I set it to space between, it essentially ignores the first and last margin and sets the inner elements to be all the same. So that's very helpful as well. So the first and last items will sort of hit their edges and the remaining space is distributed between the rest of those items, like so. So again, Flexbox is just all about how that space that's left over is distributed between the elements. And then the last one here is space. Did we already do space around? Yeah, we did space around. Oh, space evenly is the last one here. So space evenly makes it so that the margins are exactly the same between all of the elements. And these exact same properties exist for the align items. All right, now let's look at this align items property that's currently set to stretch. So the default of align items you can see is stretch. So instead of doing that, I wanna set that to start. And now they're up there and again, I can set that to center just like we looked at. And in this case right here, this is how you basically do centering in CSS. You can set the justify content to center and then the align item center and you have perfect horizontal and vertical centering, right? That was the holy grail of CSS for the last 20 years. So Flexbox makes that pretty easy to do just with those two properties. So now they're kind of both at the starting value, so top and left. And what happens here is if I were to scroll over here, so right, I don't have any breaking happening. So I'm going to set this break back to wrap and showcase how this align items works. So if I rotate over here, you can see now I'm allowing it to break down into its second row, so to speak. And because align items is at the start, my this favorite child right here is at the start of its row or the top of its row. And this one right here is at the top of its row. And so if I set this to end, they're now both at the bottom of their respective rows. And if I would break this down further so I get another row, you can kind of see how that space is just distributed. So my, my content is 300 pixels and that's just being evenly distributed between those rows, um, or sorry, start. And I'm gonna set my min height here back up to 500 pixels. So the question becomes then, well, what if I want this favorite child to be at the end and this to be at the top. Well, you would maybe think, okay, well, let's just do that space between. So I can say um, space dash between, like we stopped, talked about before, but that doesn't quite work. It just makes it stretch. It goes back to the default stretch. And that's because when we're using the align items, we're talking about each individual items within its row. And there is nothing above or below favorite child in this row, so I can't really align it this way. And that's why we have a separate property, I'm gonna undo that, that is for the actual content and it's called align-content. This one's not often as used, but this one is sort of, sort of, you can think of it the same way of align items. However, it treats the entire thing as its uh, wrapper. So the parent element is sort of um, treated as the parent and then each of the rows are treated as its content. So in this case, now I can set space between um, to a property like that, and then that behaves like you're expecting. This favorite child will always be on the bottom. This will always be on the top. I can also do all those other ones, space around, um, space evenly, just like we learned before, and it will distribute that space depending on how many rows there are. So it kind of does that for every single row. So let's set this back to space between. And then if a third row comes in because of breaking, so right there, you can see it just gets sent to the bottom because we have space between. Now that one jumps down there. Okay, so the align content property treats individual rows as if they were individual flex items.
and then it distributes everything with the same characteristics of the other properties we learned about. All right, now there's only two more properties we need to look at. So what's interesting is, right, there's a default layout in HTML and CSS, and the order that elements display is the order in which they're declared in HTML. So the oldest is first, the peacemaker is second, et cetera, et cetera. Now, typically, if I wanted to have to reverse these order, I would have to cut this guy out and paste him above there, and now he would be first, right? The peacemaker would be first. So you literally have to change your source code as far as the HTML structure in order to change that order. Well, with Flexbox, I can actually change the order and leave the original HTML alone. And the property name is literally called order. So let's take a look. I'm gonna come here to the second child. So this is our peacemaker child, and I'll just give him the order. And I'm gonna set the order to uh, four, okay? So the number four and save. And you can see now he jumps to the end of the list. The order starts at one, so this would be one, two, three. So there's an inherent order that's applied, but if you override the inherent order, then it sort of rearranges itself, right? And you can see that it's still, the Peacemaker child is still the second div, but it's visually being displayed as the last div in the stack. And then all of those Flexbox properties work now. So if I was to take this um, let's go ahead and we'll just do the flex direction just to illustrate this and we'll just set this to reverse row dash reverse He's now first right even though he's second in the order because I set his order to four Which was last and then I reversed it which makes him now first the last property is how we can have individual items um, override the parent flex so right so the parent is always saying, okay, display flex and then lay yourselves out according to these rules. So we typically apply all those rules to the parent element. Well, of course, there's always a rebellious child. That's why I have the rebel child here. And he wants to do his own thing. So we can do that as well. So I'm gonna come down here to the rebel child, which is this one right here. And in this case, I'm going to set, let's see, we have justify, let's say align items, start. So I'm gonna set the align uh, self to end. And you can see, sure enough, that rebel child is now aligning himself at the end instead of the start, which is what the parent is telling everyone to do. So each individual child can rebel on their own and they can declare their own property. And we use the align self. There is no justify self because you have to have more than one child in order to use justification. So that really doesn't make sense. There's only align self um, is the property on individual children. All right, I lied. There's actually one more thing with Flexbox. Now, you'll notice that there's a little bit of a gap between all of my elements here, a space in between, and I kind of got lazy and I just created a little CSS rule here at the top that called for a margin and a padding. So I'm gonna delete that. So nothing has those margins and paddings now. So everything is sort of butting up to one another. And I'm gonna show you this final property. I'm gonna take this little thing we did here on that uh, rebel child and set him in line so he gets back to where he's supposed to go. And there is a property that's called gap. And this is a really handy property. So I can come to my flex parent, uh, the one that declares the actual flex, and I can set this property called gap. And gap is just a value. So I can set this to 25 pixels or something else like that. And you can see what this does is it automatically sets a gap, but only between the elements, not on the left and right or the outsides of the elements. So it's a really easy way where you can space out your columns without having to deal with padding and negative margins and all these other tricks that people have been using in CSS to create uh, sort of those gutters, if you will, in between columns. Now, the last thing I want to point you to here is a little bit of a cheat sheet. So uh, the folks over at CSS Tricks put this together, and I think it's really handy. Um, it's, it's often difficult to remember, right, what is space between or space around, and you always get those confused. So it's just a quick visual guide to Flexbox. And I'm going to just quickly run through this, and you'll see this is everything we've learned in this tutorial. So we have flex direction, right? That's which way they're going, whether it's up or down or backwards. We have flex wrap. That determines, right, if a row is allowed to wrap or not. Justify content determines the alignment on the main axis. Start, end, center, space around, space between. So we looked at all those properties. Let's jump over here to this column right here. So this is the uh, align content, right? That treats the entire element as a whole. So we can start, end, center, stretch, space between, space around as that. We also have align items. So that's individual items in their rows. Start, end, center, stretch. We learned all of those. Uh, I think that's everything in this row. Yep. And the last little column here is the order property. We just learned about the order property. Note here, you can also use negative values if you want something to go clear to the front.
And then we have the flex shrink, flex grow, flex basis. This is how we started everything off with, right? Because this is the key understanding of Flexbox. And then we have the align self property and that's it. So all these properties are sort of just uh, syn syntax sugar as they call it. The key understanding of Flexbox I hope you learned today is just understanding that Flexbox is just taking the available space left and then how that space is distrib distributed between all of the items and if they're allowed to grow or shrink and by what ratio. That's really all there is to it. So I hope you've learned a lot in this lesson and uh, give us a thumbs up, like, subscribe, uh, share it with your friends if you like your friends. Um, if you have enemies, share it with your enemies if you dislike them. Either way, it's a win, win, win. We'll see you guys in the next one.